hello, people of YouTube land, and also people that follow the Cringe Crew Gaming Discord, and those that follow Ted and I on Twitch. I am Traductus. And I'm Ted. And this is the Cringe Crew Gaming James Bond Review Podcast, where I, a James Bond fan, and Ted, a filthy, filthy casual, watch the James Bond movies, and we get of our perspectives from me being a diehard fan and Ted being a newbie. Uh, and today we are watching, uh, we watched uh, and are reviewing The World is Not Enough, which is the 19th Bond film out of the official canon, 20th if you include um, Never Say Never Again, at least, you know. 20th that we've covered now um because we skipped over uh casino royale uh 1967 which we will get to uh after we do our casino royale episode of the official canon um that being said uh the, the world is not enough was made in 1999 and was directed by michael apted he is best uh Known for directing movies such as Coal Miner's Daughter, uh, Daughter, which is about Loretta Lynn, mm. uh, Gorillas in the Mist, and uh, Nell. It's actually uh, directing those films. That's why he ended up getting the job. I don't know why uh, the guy that directed beforehand only directed uh, Tomorrow Never Dies. But again, we got another one shot. Um, people that were thought of... Uh, suggested to uh uh initially direct the movie was uh joe dante who's known for uh gremlins and i believe the first howling movie mm -hmm. yes he's uh directed the howling and oh apparently also directed the burbs hmm. gremlins kind of slapped like that direction oh, wait, sorry made this movie sorry better. sorry Gr oh oh yeah oh never mind he did gremlins and gremlins too okay <laughs> I was like, oh no, he did Gremlins too. Yeah, he did Gremlins, seem, Gremlins too. Seems like better direction than this one, but we'll get there. Yeah, and then uh, also Peter Jackson. He was given the hmm. opportunity to direct uh, since Barbara Broccoli liked his uh, movie Heavenly Creatures. However, uh, she also saw The Frighteners and didn't care for The Frighteners, so therefore uh, she had no further interest in having Peter Jackson as director. And unfortunately, Peter Jackson actually said this since uh, typically the Broccoli is like going after directors that are, aren't like completely well known. He doesn't think he'll get like another opportunity to uh, um, direct a Bond film just because of the Lord of the Rings and with Peter Jackson being a household name now. Um, that being said... Um, this movie had a budget of $135 million and uh, got a box office uh, total of $361.8 million. Um, also, we have uh, uh, new screenwriters. Uh, Michael G. Wilson actually does not take part in uh, screenwriting. He is solely just a producer with his... Uh, uh, I assume like half sister or stepsister, one or or um the uh people that are did the script in this are um uh Neil Purvis and Robert Wade who will be doing the script writing all the way up to No Time to Die. So uh a little shaky start, uh <laughs> I would say. Oh, wow. uh, and uh I'm surprised they kept them on after the next one, but <laughs> cross that bridge when we'll we get... come to it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um But uh definitely give things that are interesting on that. Um Basically, the idea of uh, the whole entire thing of this uh, movie uh, came across um, when Barbara Broccoli saw like a uh, news report on oil companies vying for control of the Caspian Sea. So, therefore, uh, this movie is uh, revolved around that. And uh, 
as for casting decisions, um, I'm not sure why uh, some people were. Uh, uh, we'll, cross, uh, we'll cross that bridge later on, too, I promise. Too, yes, why they were cast. Uh, however, I can uh, give you a list. Uh, we have uh, Surfing Marceau as Electra Keen, who is an oil heiress uh, that Bond has uh, protecting. And uh, spoiler alert. This is the uh, movie where the main Vaughn villain is a woman, and Electric Kid is revealed to be the overarching villain. And most people would probably know Sophie Marceau in her role in this movie, and also uh, her role as Princess Isabella in the movie Braveheart. Braveheart. Uh, she she had a very recognizable face, despite me not seeing Braveheart a bunch of times. She looks like somebody you definitely recognize. Yeah. Oh, never mind. Did that well, this actually says how she got the role. She actually got it uh due to her performance in Firefight. Uh okay. also considered for the role was Sharon Stone and uh uh Vera Farmiga, who uh is in the uh known for her roles in the uh mm -hmm. Conjuring, Conjuring Two, Annabelle Comes Home, and Conjuring the Devil Made Me Do It. Oh look, she was she's Lorraine Warren in those movies. Okay. Uh as like a secondary villain, who we are led to believe is the main villain, uh, Robert Carlyle as uh, Renard. Uh, Carlyle's role was also offered to Javier Bardem, who ends up playing a Bond villain in Skyfall. But we'll get to that bridge when we get to it. And uh, uh, Gene Reno, uh, known for his role in uh, Ronin. Uh, the Da Vinci Code, Godzilla, and uh, Mission Impossible. Da Vinci Code. How about that? All right. And uh, oh, and also Leon the Professional, which uh, launched um, Natalie Portman's career. That movie. Um, Robert Carlyle is uh, probably best known for playing Bakeby in the Train Spotting movies, and also Rumpelstiltskin in Once Upon a Time. Um. Other people that are added in here, uh, as a subordinate to uh, Valentin Sarovsky, Robbie Coltrane comes back as Valentin. Uh, that would be uh, UK DJ J, uh, Goldie. Uh, he plays uh, Mr. Bullion, which, uh, you know, really on the nose on that one, ain't it? <laughs> <laughs> A little bit. And, uh,. I think that covers like the main people. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's in this. Th there's one more that I'm. I know we're gonna get to, so we're gonna leave her off of this list. Uh, list, um, yeah. The the one thing that I do want to say about casting, uh, before we move on to anything else, um, not necessarily a benefit or a detriment to this movie, but uh, there were so many actors that I've seen do so many really great things in other places. Um, I know a lot of what Stallman listed there were significantly newer than this film, uh, specifically the woman who'd been in the yes. Thor Conjuring films. Um, what's his name who played in uh, Once Upon a Time? Like there were there were Robert so many Carlisle. actors. Yes, there were so many actors, actresses that I've seen do so many good things outside of this movie. Casting by name alone and their ability was fantastic this is probably the first movie that i've recognized most if not everybody like they really picked some really good names and really good actors for it yeah sans mm -hmm. probably one person which we will get to not huh. in likes and dislikes but a uh, very oh, own she... section we might as well do that now before we move on to anything else to All be right, completely yes. honest All right. so the biggest detriment to this fucking movie uh all right here's the thing all right all right dr christmas jones nuclear physicist okay we are not cynical as in saying that sh that the person played her is like not is unrealistic because like oh wow a hot chick as a uh well as a physicist say, right as a physicist or like she's like too young and there was actually a complaint about her like her wardrobe and stuff like that like it's like well okay she's not dressed like a scientist but that's not the issue here of her not being believable in her role um yeah. but anyway uh, uh I, here's the thing a young 
physicist would do the type of job that she's doing, which is a shit job of like uh, basically decommissioning nuclear warheads. Problem is, is that it is played by Denise Richards. D- I okay. I've seen Denise Richards in a million and a half fucking things, and I've never seen her act. Not once. Not in this. Not in Blue Mountain State. Not in t- in fucking Two and a Half Men. Not in. Fu- and, d- give me Starship any, Troopers. Any she was fucking... okay in, but she was a ditz in that. Uh, Wild Things. She... The only thing that people really talk about Wild Things is that she has a sex scene with Nev Campbell in it. If if I'm just. I, I know this podcast doesn't have a lot of reach, but I'm just here to tell you that if you're in charge of casting of any fucking acting whatsoever and you put Denise Richards in your shit, you disrespect your own creation and also fuck you. I know that she was a big name in the late 90s to early 2000s. Like This was like right after Wild Things and also after Starship Troopers. So if she was, you know, a hot commodity then. Uh... And I will, and here's the thing, despite me not caring for her as an actress, I will give her this. She isn't given a lot in this movie. Uh, Like, it's literally her being Captain Obvious. Right, but I'm afraid that if they gave her more in this movie, that she'd ruin that too. Like, being given nothing, she still sucks. Yeah, her delivery's not good at all. And we'll actually talk about the dialogue and... I wouldn't say likes and dislikes, but like middle of the road, because a lot of people are hit or miss throughout this entire movie she is the only one that's consistently terrible throughout this entire movie she does not really act it's like she's reading her lines off and like this monotone voice that seems oblivious to everything like i I, like i feel bad for like giving shit on like midge in uh a view to a kill (laughs) but like It's kind of the same thing, but at least, like, Midge and A View to a Kill, like, at least you can see, like, she's like, yeah, I got the job because, like, I'm trying to do investigation on, like, you know, Christopher Walken fucking with my family. This, like, it's just, like, you're supposed to believe that someone as dense as Denise Richards is a nuclear physicist. I just, man, it it really sucks that the smartest thing she's done in or outside of her acting has been marrying Charlie Sheen, right? Like, which, it just... Which is a bad thing. That's what I'm saying. Which like is a it bad just, thing. It just... Marrying Charlie Sheen is not a good thing. I, I just, the, like, her performance... The, the, Stallman's right that the role that she was given really, really sucked. However, she managed to be bad at a bad role. Like, you could tell that the role given to her was next to nothing, and it's, like, her performance still detracted from the role. Denise Richards is fucking terrible. I'm so glad we're doing this on a two, on a Thursday, because if this was the weekend, I would be chugging this bottle of rum that's been looking at me all fucking day, just, oh, we're, we're just remembering this goddamn performance. Oh, God. But anyway, I think that's a good overall, and I guess we'll go with dislikes first, since we're already uh, yeah, yeah, into we're on, the hate. We're on a negative <laughs> attitude, we might as well. <laughs> Uh, if you want to, ta- if you want to take point, how about it? Yeah. And for the record, for the record, I like this movie. Okay, like, um, it, there's definitely worse Bond films out there than this movie. Uh, case in point, uh, I think the biggest issue with this movie is sound. Sounds all over the place. Um, <sighs> which is unfortunate because the last few like uh, movies we haven't bitched about the sound. Like, we've actually praised the sound, especially no, in the last one. I, I know I've had a million complaints about Foley artists, about the balancing of sound a million times through this podcast, but I feel like it's been ignored for the past three or four weeks. Like, this one was so egregiously bad, I couldn't do anything else with my time other than have my hand perfectly over the sound button so I could adjust it any two-second interval at length. Even the music that was playing consistently didn't stay at the same volume while it was playing in the same track. It, the, the, the balancing was awful. Especially in the action scenes, because it was way too fucking loud. The action scenes, and, the action and, scenes fucking boomed. The dialogue in between the action scenes was like somebody whispering from four houses down from yours good luck it's just if there's so bad. talking and good luck if there's talking in action scenes because like you're not going to be able to hear the dialogue because 
boom, boom, right. boom, 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 the, boom. The music and the actions way out outweighed the, the dialogue. Like, if we didn't have subtitles, there would have been several lines that I didn't know were spoken in the first place. Let alone being able to hear what they said, but just knowing that they happened. It and was I guess, awful. I guess we'll go with dialogue. There's a lot of dialogue that's really good in this movie, but there's also a lot of bad dialogue. A lot of bad dialogue that really, really, like, kills a lot of things. Like, uh, Sophie Marceau's character of Electric King. Honestly, in concept, really great. Overall, a good performance, but there's a few fucking choices of dialogue that are just way over the pay place, and the tonal shifts. Great, she's supposed to pretend that she's a good person, and until, like, you know, the, the switch and stuff, but they kind of do a little bit of, like, uh, a janky tone with it, because at first it's like, okay, she's being a spoiled brat like in, like uh, Whitney Houston and The Bodyguard. If I if that's the right term for is if that is that the right movie I'm thinking of Whitney Houston and uh, uh, Kevin Costner is it The Bodyguard? Right. All right. Hmm. Anyway, like no, Stoneman but, Stoneman's completely right about the dialogue that like everything was just completely weak. There was. I I guess that okay. You know the best thing that I can compare it to, right? At its absolute best during this movie, right? The dialogue was like watching a new hope, like a Star yeah. Wars a new hope when as a 7-year-old, right? Where like yeah. they're just saying a lot of <laughs> shit that doesn't matter and doesn't care towards the plot that you're there for, right? That like it's not but that it's, it's not well developed. It sounds like consistent with what the movie's supposed to be but you have a feeling while they're saying it that it just doesn't matter. At its worst, right. the dialogue is a bunch of fucking middle school hockey players chirping at each other with shit that's just about each other's moms. Like, it's just, like, there's there's no <laughs> point in this movie where you feel like the dialogue benefits the thing that you're watching. Yeah. And the plot's the same thing. Like, there's a lot of parts in this plot that, you know, there's shit that could be trimmed. There's also a lot of things where it kind of sort it's like, okay, it makes sense now, but like uh before it's not like you have any intrigue or anything. It's just like uh a big example, the skiing chase. It's like Oh god. It's like, okay, why are the things not going after Electra? We know now it's like, okay, there's their sole purpose was to kill Bond. But at the same time, it comes out like an extra action scene for action's sake, you know, it's, yeah. it doesn't give you any mystery or intrigue. And, and, and you feel like that, what that scene wasn't ne necessarily extraneous if they could have added the dialogue that made it seem purposeful, but it was just like, Hey, we're in the middle of this plot. Who wants to take a ski trip? Like it, it just everything like the plot was extraneous and over the top and, and pushed a lot of shit that didn't matter for stuff that couldn't make you care about it. But the dialogue that could have helped those really shitty parts of the plot didn't and vice yeah. versa. The plot could have been good enough to carry the bad dialogue. It, same way. Like it just, both things were subpar. Another thing I don't like is uh, how Money Penny is in this movie. Like, uh, Money Penny, ha like, uh, how Samantha Bond has kind of played Money Penny as, like, has, like, a little bit of an antagonistic relationship with Bond, but it's kind of, like, a playful, as in, like, friends, like, you know, like, you know, just kind of poking the stick at a friend, you know, making fun of your friend. Or, like, playing, like, a gag or a joke on a friend. However, in this one, she's, like, a jealous bitch. Uh, yeah, which I don't blame her, but like it seems so out of character of how she's been played by not only Lois Maxwell, Carolyn Bliss for like how little time she had, and that's fine. But even with like Samantha, how Samantha's Bond has played Money Penny in the last previous films, she's not really bitter about anything. She's just like, you know kind of just being a dick for her own amusement while here it, she's like very malicious about like like uh like right off the bat like asking like bond for an engagement ring knowing that she's not going to commit and then knowing that the uh doctor slept with bond and then just being like really catty towards her and it's just 
it just seems so out of character of like how we've known Money Penny to be. Yeah, it, it, it's definitely over the top from from where it's been. Like it used to be like a playful antagonist to to now just egregiously rude. But I, again, I'll I'll chalk that one again up to dialogue and just really shitty writing for lines. <sighs> Ugh. Um, let's see. Um, I'd say like the actions, a lot of the action scenes have like, uh, have, are a little dated. There are ones that are like really, that are actually not bad, but at the same time, they're kind of overdone. Yeah. Yeah. This, um, and I also kind of think the ending is a little bit anticlimactic sort of, but, uh, like the fight uh... between Bond and Renard, like it's all right, but like it's. It's nothing as like it's nothing as satisfied as it was when Carver got fucking murdered, you know? Yeah, it was undersold, for sure. For sure. Uh I, I'm with you on the the datedness of it. Like I, I I guess I'm at a point with movie watching, like in general, not necessarily with bonds, but where I shouldn't be able to watch eight seconds, any eight seconds of a movie and know what decade it got filmed in. You know what I mean? And and this one from start to finish just screamed nineties, like especially it, late nineties. Right, it just everything felt like that. It had this weird nineties grain on it. Everything like sort of just sat in a way that like, hey, we don't have to make a good movie. We just have to make an action movie because that's what sells right now. Like, and it, also it just and also cinematography a was a little bit all over the place because some cine- some scenes actually it's like, oh wow, this looks like a movie. Then there's other scenes where it's like. This looks like it should be like in a TV show, like Smallville, like uh, the fire, like the scene where they reveal Renard, you know, when they finally see him and they're in like the fire thing. For some reason, like the picture quality was like made for TV and yeah. it was weird. Yeah. Um, and it does this like it goes back and forth on this throughout the movie until it gets towards like kind of the end. Then it finally, you know stays consistently a movie you know a theatrical movie but like it, um it, it, i i again not to chart chirp back on things we've said already but the weak plot line i feel like also contributed to that was that like to, a lot it just of this, made everything look cheap and, and and it felt like it could be a tv episode if they cared to stretch it like because they put so little care into how their movie looked, you know what I mean? Like better, yeah. better direction and better cinematography could have made for the things that happened in the movie feeling better. Yeah, I yeah I agree. Um, and all of these are like steps. Not only step back steps back from like Tomorrow Never Dies. They're step backs from even like Goldeneye, and I even like. That's pretty bad when you like have steps back from like two movies ago, <laughs> and, especially with so much time having passed. And uh, a good example of this is the sexism. We're back to having like sexism as like a uh, negative in this movie. Like it's it's not Sean Connery egregious or even Roger Moore egregious. Like you know Roger Moore era egregious. But, like, it's about on a little bit almost to, like, the Roger Moore level. Yeah, I I, I, I guess I phrased it a little differently on my list. Like, while things definitely came across as sexist, which felt, you know, bad, weird, dated, yeah, you choose your adjective. But um, yeah, it more just felt like through the whole movie there was a weird sexual tension, right? Yeah. Where, like, every... There there were several movies throughout this series where, like, Bond could make a quip about somebody shooting poorly, right? Like, Yeah. A- and it didn't have to necessarily be about sticking a dick in something, right? And this right. one, every single quip was a was dick a joke. Sexual- yeah. Like, all of them. All of them. I It happened twice within a ten minute span. I was like, uh, that's kind of weird. I should mention that. I literally crossed out that note to write it again later that there was a weird sexual tension through the whole movie because it happened again which, like an hour after I wrote that note. Yeah. Which I kind of get with like uh, Electra. basically her whole thing is that she manipulates men and basically gets them to like, you know, do whatever she wants to her will because like, you know, she's a beautiful lady and uh is also 
rather, rather smart. But at the same time, like, there shouldn't really be, like, sexual tension between, like, Bond and a random extra. Well, th- <laughs> th- there's that, right? Like, you, you could chalk it up to, to the it being the villain, right, and her nature. But, like, even then, you'd expect the sexual tension to be in a different direction. It's it's never... Yes. Like, the quips are never lust for Electra, right? It's it's Right. Like, it's just general, like, general, like, haha, sex joke. Right. It's just, it's throughout the whole movie. They're just like, hey, we didn't, uh, we didn't sell sex enough with, uh, Denise Richards' dress. So you have to be thinking about tits or dick the entire movie anyway. And we're going to do it with shitty jokes that don't make sense in this context. Like, it, it just, it's the only time that, the only time that it works is when Valentin Zorowski, Robbie Coltrane goes, I must call security and congratulate them. That's the only time where I actually kind of laugh and, at those, like, you know, like the numerous fucking gratuitous sex jokes. And, and even then, like, by that point, they had ruined it. Like, it couldn't even be funny then because you're like, oh, man, another one. Like, it just, yeah, exactly. Fuck, man. Ugh. Garbage. Uh, the one thing I, I, I have to add to dislikes before we move on to likes. Um, I, I have two, actually. I'm rereading my notes again. The first kind of goes back to cinematography, but uh, effects were ex- exaggerated again, pretty pretty poorly. Uh, there were a lot of things that were just over the top and not realistic. I, I think this was more egregious towards the beginning of the film than it was towards yes. the end. But there were it, lots of effects it, it, that just didn't fit the way the movie was going. They were over the top and they were more dramatic than they were effective. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I do, I do agree on that. I, they went very extra with the action, and I wish somebody, for the sake of the next film, would have said like, "Hey, maybe we should have dialed it back." Right, I, like, I, there. All right, I'm sorry, I'm getting mad because because I know what movie's next. I, I I'm just like, I, I recognize that like, big massive dramatic action can have its place in films there's a reason michael bay is still a director right but right I, I, you get to some point where it's just like hey this isn't that dramatic and you didn't film it well so it just kind of is bad y- you know like it it just well, it, it, it sort well, of detracted from the movie yeah. the way that they dramatically overdid well, it in places that didn't need it right and, it, and and here's the thing is that a couple of movies that we've watched uh that they overdid the action in we actually it's like hey it actually worked it worked in that movie uh prime example tomorrow never dies um a couple of like over the top things uh, and thunderball worked out mm-hmm. which but, was the uh, one that, which was the one that i was complaining about the headshots that all of a sudden he's a fucking marksman with uh, um, uh, Octopussy. Yes. No, even in that one, right? There was a ton of action. It was it was super abundant, but everything fit the mood of the movie, right? Fit, like it it was it was good. I know it was dramatic and over the top, but it was it was good. This one was just dramatic because well, we haven't done enough dramatic yet, and and it it didn't yeah. sit right. Uh, the yeah. last the last complaint I have about this movie, um, for for my dislikes was that it was so slow oh the beginning's so slow the beginning is i think a lot of it has to do with the pre-title sequence being so long (laughs) i I don't even know if it was that man like i i you can just you could sit at a bar and drunkenly explain the plot of this movie to somebody in three and a half minutes and then you realize that they just take that same three and a half minutes they don't expand on it they don't develop it they don't develop characters or plot or anything it's just Three and a half which, minutes of material stretched into just over two hours. Yeah. Like it's which which is a problem because this is a very character driven movie and mm-hmm. uh like which is which which you know is great for a Bond film. Like it it more or less worked out for License to Kill. Like granted that like there like they had the issue of like not enough action in that movie, but like the characters in that movie still were interesting. And in this, they're interesting, but when the dialogue is, like, very, like, flip a coin if it's good or not, it makes a really detriment to the movie. Yeah, the the, the dialogue sucking, the, the action being lackluster, abundant, and 
uh, genuinely poor. Like and the, the black hole of talent and, that is Denise Richards. <laughs> I, <laughs> I wasn't even going to mention that there, but like the the fact that they just don't care to develop the three and a half minute plot to stretch it into two hours anyway. Like you could feel lack of concern creating a super slow pace in this movie, and it it even turned into the point where like things that could have been relevant or could have been better, like just turn into dog shit. The ski chase that Stallman mentioned earlier, right? Like that, that could have been very valuable had this movie been written or directed better. But like while you're watching it, things like that are just like, man, we're just slowing down the inevitable. We know what's coming. Like it it just, everything just felt so slow, man. This was swimming through molasses slow. We've watched slow movies. This one was egregiously fucking bad. Yeah, I, I, it's not as bad as like uh, uh, Diamonds Are Forever. I will say that. At least it's not that fucking slow. But of course, I don't know if that was slow or or more so tedious. I would, I would even give it that one tedious comparatively to this one. I would give it that one tedious instead of slow. Yeah, this, this one genuinely just how long can we make three and a half minutes stretch? This was the stretch Armstrong of movies. Just take this four inch doll and pull it into six feet long. Just it, it was so <laughs> slow. But with that being said, I guess we can go into likes. Sure. Uh, my list is pretty short. If you want me to start. Yeah. All right. Um, I the play on the villains was really cool. Stallman kind of hinted at it yeah. earlier that the the you never really knew who the villain was until we were like halfway through this movie. That there was like, hey, direction towards this guy, and she's the henchman, and eventually she just kind of takes over, takes charge, and she's like, yeah, bitch, I'm in charge. The, the, yeah, the way that the villains played off of each other to kind of conceal that was really cool. And what's crazy about that is that you almost kind of feel, despite, like, you know, Renard being, like, a sadistic bastard, you kind of feel bad for him a little bit, because you know he's being manipulated as well. Like... Yeah, yeah, it, it genuinely, it was the only bit of character development that existed in this movie. Um, like, oh my, like, like it, it, Electric King's, like, whole plot is brilliant, but, like... When... When it when it was like uh, Electra was revealed to be the main villain, right? Like as you're seeing that change, and it's and the, what's crazy is like okay, so she's she's a, it was like okay, she's a good guy, she's a villain, okay, so she's being manipulated. Then you find out she's oh twist pulling the whole strings. It's like <laughs> right. Well, that's that's just it, right? Is when you when you come to that realization, like when it's like oh shit, she's the main villain. My first thought was not man, that was a good twist. My first thought was man, I wish they did this three movies ago so I could have seen a Timothy Dalton film where the characters were thoroughly right. developed. Right. The like there was so much but with with the way in such a shitty movie, the way that that was portrayed here, where it gave you that solid, firm twist, I wish we could have seen that in a well-directed, well-acted movie. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing if not scuffed. No, I, right. I, I, uh, I, I just, like, while it was very cool, I, I wish it could have been done better, but it, it, as far as things that I did enjoy, like, that's very, very, very high on my list. Um... The other thing that I have is that uh, I, I, I sort of mentioned this earlier as we were going through casting, like they did a really, really good job at going to find good actors for the most part. Se several times in casting <laughs> as, as we've gone through those, like it's just somebody said hi to Cubby Broccoli at a party. So he got the job, right? Like, <laughs> right. Like. I I recognize that's specifically for the Duran Duran as a music, but but like my point, my, my, my Wait, point it is it worked. It worked for Duran Duran. My point is though that like there are so many people that are just have just kind of casually come across the role and this springboarded them. Um, yeah. Whether this was the springboard or people were already established in this movie, there was so much effort put into finding quality actors for casting. Yeah, Denise like, Richards Robbie, being Robbie the Coltrane hits this movie out of the park and it sucks that he dies. I, I, I won't even suck that he dies. I won't even say that acting was good in this movie. Like while he was the best of the actors in this movie, like in this movie, the, his acting's not really that great, but at the same time, like he, 
it's he's at least entertaining to a movie that's kind of sort of dollish. Right. I, I just like th- my my big positive for that is that they didn't just settle with anybody Cubby Broccoli has said hi to before. They went well, out. He, they found well, Cubby act- Broccoli passed away, so I, therefore it, okay. it would be his fine. So be it semantics, daughter. Stallman. I get it. My point is, <laughs> my point is that these are all actors with chops. Like even the ones that they yeah. used this to springboard turned into very good actors or actresses, right? Yes. Like the. They really did their homework to make sure that they put the best actors or actresses. Yeah, because John in Cleese place. is even in this as like a Q's replacement, and we'll get to uh, that. Yeah, uh, it, why uh, Q ends up? Well, of course they were planning on replacing Q, but like why Q gets replaced earlier than was supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I like like I said, just they did a really good job putting the right actors in the right places. They just. Yep. They, Again, the detraction to that is that they scripted them and wrote them poorly. Uh, but Ugh. they they did do the work. They did do the legwork. Yep. They did their research and their homework. They went through an actual casting process to make sure that the right people were in the right places. And I I I would be remiss to not really really credit them with that. Yeah, there's a lot of things that they've done right and a lot of things that they've done wrong that kills a lot of things they do right. Uh, I also like to say, like, Judy Dench's performance in this is amazing. Like, she does actually a pretty damn good job in this. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll disagree with you there, because I thought her performance in the last two movies was significantly better than this one. She had a bigger oh, role. I, I, I but... agree, I agree. A bigger, but, like, bigger role in this one, but d- definitely not the same acting performance we got in the last two. Not even close. Uh, that I mean, I I would agree on that, but uh, I'm just saying compared to like all the stuff that we've seen in this movie, fair, <laughs> fair. Comparatively, <laughs> she fucking nailed it. <laughs> um, another thing that I like is that how, again, with like Elektra's character, how big of like a manipulator that he that she is is that. Bond even tries to talk sense into her throughout the entire thing, thinking that, you know, like, okay, I get that she's pissed off that her uh, dad, like, you know, didn't give her, like, the money for the kidnapping, and she's trying to quarter the oil market, but she's like, but he's still like, hey, like, you're gonna kill, like, all these people with your plan by setting off, like, a nuclear meltdown that... You think people are going to think it's going to be an accident. They're not going to think it's an accident. And then right at the end, he finally has a gun to her. And he's just like, it's like, you know, call your boyfriend off. Yeah. Like, <laughs> call him off. And she's like, oh, you're not going to shoot me. You're not going to shoot me because you're still in love with me. And like, Bond shoots her. You know, like, he tries like 800 steps before he knows that he has to finally kill her. Ellen feels bad at the fact that he has to, that he actually killed her. And there's like numerous times where she is such a good manipulator that it's like numerous times where people are just like, people, you know, they can tell that they're kind of being manipulated, but they don't want to believe it. Yeah. And I really love that concept. Again, shit, there's I, so many good concepts in this. Yeah, again, and, uh, co- concept for that character is fantastic. Writing ruined yeah. the positives. I'm ugh. concept it, it for Bernard me. is amazing as well. Like he can't feel pain because he got shot in the head, and then the bullets like cutting off his nerve endings. So therefore, he is routinely losing his senses, and the fact that he can't feel pain means he can overexert himself. So it's not like he gets stronger as in super strength, but it's like he can push himself so far that it's like he's having like you know like mm-hmm. super strength. Which, by the way, was supposed to be uh, an attribute for Stamper in the last movie, but uh, obviously we get milk toast. You know, <laughs> I stamp things in that movie and we get the awesome fucking like, I can't feel pain. I'm overexerting myself. I'm already dead because there's a bullet in my head. I don't give a fuck what happens, you know, and uh, Mr. On a suicide mission because he thinks this chick that he kidnapped loves him. <laughs> We get that guy in this movie. 
<laughs> and he's kind of wasted and over, you know, shadowed by Electra, which is fine because, you know, Electra is, you know, the main villain, but like it seems such a Bernard seems such a waste in this movie. Hard to disagree. With that concept. Hard to disagree. <sighs> uh anything uh, else on your list? Uh I like John Cleese in this. Uh he's gonna be Q in the next one. Uh, I think um, Desmond Llewellyn's send-off in this, which is always have an escape plan, is uh, really great. Unfortunately, he ends up not being Q again because after this movie, uh, he died in a car accident. Um, it, it, and I have to say that... It, it was a good send-off, but it came at an unfortunate time, right? Like time. You didn't yeah. recognize it as a send-off, but armed with hindsight, like it was really good. And, uh, I will say this, like, as much as I like John Cleese in the next movie, Alan, the person ends up playing Q in Skyfall and the movies after Skyfall are all right. Desmond Llewellyn is def for just for the sheer fact that he's played Q for so long, definitely a hard man to replace. Absolutely. And for a lot of people, that's Q. Uh, I mean, like twenty out of what twenty seven, twenty eight movies. Like, yeah, I, I uh, yeah, I would say uh, so. Yeah, he was Q from uh, from Russia with Love all the way to this one. So, <laughs> <laughs> I don't. You and, watched him age. You watched it, him fit his role. You watched him like grow into the place that he was supposed to be. And, and you even watch even him develop. Movies. Yeah, like how he interacts with Bond. And to be honest, I think Desmond Llewellyn and. Uh, Pierce Brosnan had like the best interactions, especially in Goldeneye. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, I give you um, that. Still, the best line of I think the <laughs> entire series with Desmond Llewellyn is Q is "Don't touch that. That's my lunch." But um, <laughs> and this film, my favorite line is actually utter. <laughs> See, Goldie, uh, despite being Valentin's lackey, uh, is also Electra's lackey, so therefore he betrays Valentin. And when he sees Valentin, like, survives, like, this explosion, he goes, Boss, you're alive! It's so good to see you! And when Valentin shoots him, he goes, Me too! Yeah. <laughs> Which I really love that line, just because, like, how, like, Goldie's just trying to, like, I don't know what to do! My boss is alive! Maybe I can spruce him over? Nope. <laughs> um... Other than that, I uh, there isn't really much I can else I can say except like there's a lot of concepts that are good, like the mystique around Renard, the reveal of Renard is great, and then despite him being undercut, uh, the acting from Robert Carlyle is actually probably one of the few people that's really I mean, one of the people that's actually good across the board. There isn't really any like. Even though some of the lines might like be like kind of like wonky, he at least like the delivery is actually at least consistently good. That's um, fair. Sophie Marceau, when she's when like she's able to nail it, she nails it. Um, Robbie Coltrane consistently good. Uh, comparatively to everything that's in this movie, like Judy Dench is actually mm. very well. Although, like we've stated, has done good things before. I like John Cleese in this. Uh, Pierce Brosnan as Bond. Um, I'm neutral on in this. Like, I, it's not bad, but, like, we've seen him do so much better. I, I thought it was weak performance comparatively. Like, I wouldn't say that he did a bad job, but it's worse yeah. than we've seen him do. Yeah. He's not phoning it in like Sean Connery, although he does slip up. And goes full Irishman in one line, but it's <laughs> it's in one line, not the entire film. All right, he is not Sean Connery, and it's not like, ah, eh, fuck you, pay me. You know, he is not at to this point or at uh at any point in the series, oddly enough. But then again, when you do four films as opposed to like what Connery giving up at like five and six, yeah, and like completely not giving a shit in like the new one that they brought him in. <laughs> So, uh, there's that, um, other than that, that's literally all I got. I do have, like, 
I will say this, I have high nostalgia feelings for this movie because um, this is the first movie that I watched on pay-per-view when it was new. Like, GoldenEye, I didn't watch until, like, not, you know, after, like, the video game came out. And I stated before, I didn't watch uh, Tomorrow Never Dies when it came out because it was, like, out of then I never saw anything of it. Uh, my parents, they had, you know, they ended up having, went, they uh, ditched the cable company after the cable company pissed off my mom. <laughs> and we got a satellite dish. <laughs> oh, yeah, like, like one channel didn't have any sound, the other channel didn't have picture but just sound. And when my mom called the cable company, they said you should be lucky that you even have cable. And she's like, "Fuck you, I'm getting a satellite dish." And we've had dish ever since. Fair. And uh, they had pay per view channels, and so uh, you know, uh, we watched uh, the world was not enough on pay per view, and I played the video game very religiously, which I didn't complete until uh, college. Nifty. Because like the last, yeah, because the one level with like the uh, helicopters with the saw blades, one of the few action scenes that are extra, but like doesn't really go too ridiculous, even though the effects are a little dated. Um, uh, that level was a pain in the ass, but I was banished to beat that in high school. And then there was another level of the pain in the ass, which was going through the sub submarine while it was sunk. And I kept drowning because you're underwater and shit like that. Now, I'll say this. Despite me saying that the fight scene between, like, uh, Renard and Bond in this movie being anticlimactic, it's even more anticlimactic in, uh, <laughs> in the video game. Because after... No, because there's no fight. There's no fucking fight. I was thinking, oh, my, I guess there's going to be a hand-to-hand -hand combat fight. That would be freaking awesome. Because, like, you kill... you 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 Because, like, Robbie Coltrane doesn't kill Bullion. You kill Bullion. And it's like, all right, well, that's... You know, okay, so you, you need a sub-boss. You kill all extra. That was actually, you know, interesting. And then, uh... And then, you know... And then you go with Renard. You put after after the end of this entire freaking grueling maze, you press a button and Renard dies by cutscene with that fucking uh plutonium rod going through him. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> All right. Anyway. Overall overall good game, but yeah, we're not talking about the game, we're talking about the movie, so ah, uh, God, overall thoughts. Uh not the worst movie that we've seen. By a long shot, but definitely not as good as Tomorrow Never Dies, not as good as Goldeneye. It's definitely a step back from those. And uh, I'm interested to see where Ted puts his, because uh, despite the nostalgia feeling that I have for this, uh, it's not going to be as high as I thought it was going to be. Oh, I I can I can give you a pretty accurate ranking. I think I decided pretty early on throughout this podcast where it was going. Um, so I stuck it at 14th. Right between License to Kill and Never Say Never Again. Say Never Again. Yep. Uh, so, look, we've definitely watched worse. There were movies that were, like, egregiously bad, right? This one felt yep. bad for a lack of concern. Never Say Never Again was phoning it in, trying to make money again for Connery and trying to steal it away. Like, they put effort into being bad, it felt like. <laughs> this has to be above that, because it was an effort into being bad. But also, a lack of concern doesn't go much further for me. I, weirdly enough, that License to Kill is above this one, but this it's really, really, really phoned it in. They just could, kind of took things from other movies. They stretched a pretty piss-poor plot into a really long movie that didn't need to be. They took shitty action. The, the filmmaking didn't make up for any of the gaps that the shitty movie was. The dialogue was garbage. The performances from actors that i know could do better and didn't just like there were so many things that i like i just really don't have a whole lot of positives i yeah. have to put that one here it felt like it just kind of defaulted to 14th for me here's the funny thing all right this is the first time i think i'm actually having a bond film ranking lower than yours i no think way. wait no 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 never mind never mind no man with the golden gun yeah but like uh of course, that's usually like, you know. I'm not. I think this might be the first time me doing it right away, maybe. Okay. Maybe. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Man with the Golden Gun was the last time, I think. 
still. I'm putting it, I'm putting this between uh, a view to a kill and never say never again. Put it at fifteen. Right. And the reason why I do that, I did that, is because like despite uh the flaws of like a view to a kill and you only live twice to me there was a lot of i guess more effort put into them if that makes sense i think mm -hmm. uh like despite like uh because like the sets were really great and you only live twice and uh um, despite, like, some things not working out, I attribute a lot of that to, like, dated special effects. Wow. Uh, also, with A View to a Kill, uh, literally what puts A View to a Kill literally above um, The World is Not Enough for me is for the sheer fact that uh, Midge doesn't annoy the shit out of me as much as Denise Richards. <laughs> Honestly fair. Honestly fair. Like... I I, and I I I honestly honestly like I would put this if I, if I if we weren't doing like the new tie things on par with the view to a kill because it's like well casted execution. Ugh. Yeah, I, I I it surprises me to see you put it that low. To be honest, because when we were watching, like it it felt like you had a more positive attitude than I did. And I did, but, movie, but you, my you... my issue is is that more when I think about it, I'm just like. This is great. This is really, really great. I like this. I like this. And then it's just like, but it also gets killed by this. And it gets killed by this. And it gets killed by this. Can Disney's Richard just shut the fuck up? <laughs> and... <laughs> it, it, it's strange, though, because, like, you, you said, genuinely, when we finished watching the movie yesterday, you said, I don't know where I'm going to put this top half for sure, but I really don't know. And to hear you put it down at 15th, like, even below where I put it is, it's really surprising. Is really surprised. Refreshing, refreshing, because it means that I didn't hate a movie that shouldn't be hated. But yeah, um, I mean, I mean, I don't hate it. It's just, it's 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 disappointing. Mm -hmm. And it's the disappointment is the reason why I have it this low. Is it a better movie than The Man with the Golden Gun or Goldfinger? Yeah, probably. Um. Or, like, you only live twice. Or, and also a view to a kill. Yes, but the disappointment, and I think also nostalgia really has that. Because, like, to me, it's just like, oh, yeah, it's really good. And then you watch it, you're like, it's not as good as I remember it being. Fair. And I think that disappointment on just kind of re-watching it. And just, like, I remember this being really good. And then you watch it, it's like, well. Oh. It just maybe just put it lower, like fair enough, man. Fair just enough. for the sheer I, disappointment. I, I respect it. I respect it, and I appreciate the fact that, like, not alone in my opinion. Yeah, and I'm not saying it's a bad movie. Like to me, like everything above Diamonds Are Forever is a good Bond movie. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> fair enough, man. Like fair I'm not enough. saying they're perfect, but like it's not. To me, it's not a steaming pile of dog crap. <laughs> Fair. But, uh... I think that about wraps us up for this episode, unless you got anything else you need to say? Uh... I will say this much. Uh... <laughs> I'll say this much and then dead silence, Keck W. Yeah, wait, or is that... Is that 15? Oh, no, never mind. I put it at 16. Holy shit, that's low. Um, <laughs> 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 uh, I will say this, uh, brace yourselves for me and Ted to both rage on the next one, because despite, you know, Moonraker and Diamonds Are Forever being so low on our lists and Dr. No being on, low on Ted's list with, like, Ted not liking Dr. No at all, um... The next movie is considered the bad one. Right. Might I reiterate, there's movies like Diamonds Are Forever and Moonraker in this series. And Die Another Day is considered the bad Bond movie. Right. Well, not looking forward to that one, but 
we can move on from this one and uh you guys can catch up with that one next yeah. week. So maybe we could have a rage counter. <laughs> I think that, that can be arranged. One. I think that can be arranged. So right, well uh, I think that about yep. wraps it up for this episode. So be sure to catch us in the Discord. Um, still a couple more movies to watch. Uh, if you want to check us out on Tuesdays, we usually watch around 6.30 Eastern time. I'll probably stop saying that in future episodes because we're running out of movies to watch because we're so far ahead on podcasts. Um, yeah. <laughs> but in the meantime, you can still catch us on Tuesdays in the Discord with the podcast or watching the movies anyway. Um, if you want to be included in a podcast, we have a couple more opportunities for that, Keck W. Uh you can catch us both on Twitch, Stallman at Traductus, and myself at Ted Green Eagles. Um, be sure to check out previous episodes, uh, all 19 other movies, plus the uh, bonus episode we did for uh, Battle of the Bonds not that long ago. Yep. Um, two of those, I think, should be link- linked in the end screen, but I can't keep track of nothing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise, uh, we'll see you guys in the next episode, and you guys have a good one. Yep, see ya. Mm-hmm.